Why do you need to go beyond enlightenment and why would you bother to make this journey? And I suppose the resounding reason is that if you look inside your soul, you'll see that there's something missing. You always know that there's something that isn't working. There's some bit that you don't know, that you haven't found, that you're sort of wandering around looking for the key to everything without knowing what the key looks like or what it is that you're actually searching for. So the reason for this journey beyond enlightenment is really to arrive at the complete you, the authentic you, the whole you. Our human body is small, I mean sort of five to six feet tall or slightly taller, but in fact deep down we're vast, we're bigger than the universe, the whole of the Milky Way you could hold in your hand. So you're a microcosm and then there's a macrocosm version of you that is absolutely enormous. And so the reason to make the journey and the reason to go into the unknown and of course when you say unknown to people, they tend to get a little worried that you're going to be whizzing them off into some sort of totally chaotic place. But the journey into the unknown does take a certain amount of bravery. But then the yearning, the nostalgia for eternity that I speak of, is this thing where we yearn to be whole. And the journey beyond enlightenment, which of course is an ego trip enlightenment, it's a spiritual elitism, it doesn't exist. But the journey beyond enlightenment is saying, what I want is completeness, what I want is wholeness, what I want is to arrive back to where we all came from. Hello, this is Stuart Wilde. Welcome to this new audio series, The Journey Beyond Enlightenment. I'm going to show you something very empowering that is special, that is usually misunderstood or hidden away. For the journey beyond enlightenment is essentially a journey beyond the confines of this three-dimensional reality, past what you think you know to a hidden door inside a hyper-dimensional reality. There you'll see the true nature of the extraordinary power of what has come to be known as the authentic you. Normally we live in what might be a confined, rather fake, humdrum existence with little inspiration as to the future. But I'll lay out now how to step off that path and I'll tell you how many people have literally walked into another world. A magnificent world of trans-dimensional beings and helpers and the potential of a super-knowing that is not limited by false boundaries and damaging limitations of the ego and egocentric perceptions of life. There is a mirror world to this one, and I'll tell you the story of that and how to get there and what to do to help yourself once you're there. You decide how little or how much you feel you wish to explore. This audio series is slightly different to others you might have heard in the past. They usually deal with practical things. Thin thighs in 30 days, the rules of effective management of the laws regarding success and so forth. This series deals with the invisible you, the one you can't normally see. That is where your supernatural power is. It's akin to the Taoist concept of looking at the spaces between the leaves of a tree rather than looking at the actual tree. It's all about what's in the gap and how you will learn to walk into that gap. Once you're there, looking back at the world, you will never see the world the same again. 
Much of the struggle and pain falls away, and you'll see it all in a higher light. The journey beyond enlightenment is not the acquiring of new rules. It's letting go of old rules and dogma to become more free. And it's not aligned much to the world of yang and the masculine force that conquers and prospers in a commercial world. It's more embracing of the feminine and prospering in the inner worlds. Because so much healing comes from the feminine energy, which we call the feminine spirit. But the beauty of this spiritual journey is you can take as long as you wish and go as far as you wish. And going just a little way allows you to formulate a new way of looking at things. Then you can come back to the path ten years later if you wish. I have people that have been coming with me all the way that started twenty years ago. They will probably still be there at the very end. Maybe it's because they know I'll get them there. It's fine to travel down the path a ways and then take a detour to discover something about yourself. It's good not to be too dogmatic. And what works for you may not work for another. What works for me is only for the crazy guys. <laughs> you see, certain people are destined to become what I call the fringe dwellers. They're not necessarily hippie revolutionaries or new age space cadets. The fringe dwellers are different in that they silently think differently. You might have been working in a humdrum TikTok job at the post office for 40 years, but in your mind you don't belong to these systems. You know that you are a citizen of a far country a spiritual consciousness that doesn't really fit the regular mindset of this world. It makes you different, not special necessarily, it's just that you're not aligned to the way the world thinks. Being on the fringe can sometimes cause you a lot of pain and difficulty, especially if you fight it. I realized I didn't fit at about the age of 10. I was raised in Africa before television was invented. And at the age of 10, I was shipped off to an austere English boarding school. It was like a prisoner of war camp, Stalag 14. There I had to pretend to be an upper crust Englishman. But the truth was, I was neither upper crust nor English. I was a little African kid, albeit a white African kid. I knew nothing about the mindset or the ideals of an English gentleman and his pleasures, like rugby and cricket and other strange games and rituals I'd never seen before and I knew which snakes are poisonous and which are not. But that wasn't very useful on the playing fields of England. That's where my fringe dweller mentality started. At about the age of 12, I formed a small alternative society. There was about a dozen of us. We lived in the roof of the school's gymnasium. It was a perilous journey across narrow iron girders to get to the gap between the gymnasium ceiling and the outside roof of the building. Once in that magical hidden world, you had to watch your step because if you missed the iron joist that held the ceiling up, you would fall through to the gymnasium floor 20 to 30 feet below. I lived in that roof with my pals on and off for five years. Every spare moment of my school life was in that roof. We never plotted to destroy the system just to survive it. School was very nasty a very violent place and we found if we stuck together and if we pooled our resources we could not only survive but thrive. We got two shillings and sixpence pocket money each week which at today's exchange rate is about 24 cents US. But in clubbing our meagre capital we found we could buy stuff that other boys wanted, candy, food etc and sell them at a small but well-deserved profit. And so our little society of teenage fringe dwellers thrived. We felt free and safe living in the roof, away from the school prefects and masters and teachers that would beat us with a stick at the slightest excuse. And we were quick and agile and fairly fearless. We could run across the narrow iron girders that held up the roof in seconds, even in the dark, so we never got caught, not once in five years. The interesting thing was that the boy that lived in the roof was the authentic me, the feeling me, the sensitive me, the one that would share and help others. And the boy that was on the playing fields pretending to be an English gentleman was the fake competitive me, an image that was forced upon me against my will. We all suffer from conformity. It's a mind control disease. It's how society and our families legislate over us to keep us in their mental prisons. It's ghoulish, really. In my twenties, my mother, 
who was a great believer in spiritualism and mediumship, gave me a book called something like The Powers That Be. It was all about spiritualism and the hierarchies of angels that guide spiritual seekers to a higher perception. I suddenly saw there was a possible way out of this harsh world to a spiritual world, a place for those that didn't fit. It was another ceiling to discover and perhaps hide behind. To know that that was a possibility changed my life. It was an enormous impetus for me. I suddenly saw being a fringe dweller is just fine as long as you're not plotting to burn down City Hall. It's fine not to fit. It's fine to seek the society of others who also don't fit. It's fine to travel away and leave it all behind you and embark on a great journey of discovery and avoids to find the freedom of the real you. It's okay and permitted to find your own relationship with God rather than borrowing one from others or having one imposed upon you by some system of control or an institution. I soon made it my life's quest to find the hidden door, the one that leads to the celestial worlds. And after about 30 years of trial and error and a few spooky dead ends, I finally found it. And so will you, if you have a desire for it, as I'm sure you do.